Hi everyone, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Um, my name's Carl. I'm here on behalf of the TEFL Org to deliver a live webinar for the next 50 to 55 minutes or so. Um, the webinar today is going to be about whiteboard techniques, but this is a live um, TEFL Org webinar where I answer any sort of questions you might have with teaching English as a foreign language. So if you're new to it and you want a little bit of information about jobs, get a question in. I will try my best to answer it. If you want to become a TEFL teacher, get your question in. I will try my best to answer it. How this basically works is I will give a presentation, which take about 20, 25 minutes, maybe. Then after that, I get to the questions in the order they are sent to us. So if you've got a question, please put it in the chat. Please put it, you know, if you're on Facebook watching it or YouTube, please put it in the chat. They all come together through to our system and I will answer those questions when I get to them. Um, as I said, my name's Carl. I work on, I work for the TEFL Org as a teacher trainer. So I live here in Northern Ireland. And if you ever do any of the live uh, weekend courses, face-to-face uh, -face ones in Ireland, you might get to spend the weekend with me. I also work as an online teacher. I have my own online teaching business. I work as an online examiner. Um, I also have been lucky enough to have taught in many places around the world, China, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, Japan, Sri Lanka, Azerbaijan. I lived in Iraq as well, teaching for a bit. Just before COVID, I was doing examining in Spain and Italy. Um, but yeah, I basically work online most of the time out of my office here in Northern Ireland. So please let us know where you are in the world. We do like to know where everyone is. I can see Tim is in New York. How are you doing, Tim? Uh, Quang has got his question in. Elizabeth, always good to see you as well, has got his question in. Hi, Amma in Iran. Um, hi, Alejandra in Mexico. El Evelyn in Belgium. Lynn in South Wales. Hello, hello, hello. Please get. Please let us know where you are. We'd like to know where everyone is in the world. Right, let's get going with this presentation. So um, we're going to talk a bit about whiteboard techniques. So... The first thing I would say is, and I I don't mind saying this out loud, even though I am supposed to be looking like a professional right now, whiteboard techniques is something that I have always, throughout my teaching career, been told is not one of my strengths. Uh, whenever I have an observation, one of the things that the teacher, the person observing me always says to me is, your handwriting could be more tidy. And the reason being, I'm actually, uh, I've got something called dysgraphia, which basically means my handwriting isn't very good. I can't write very well, all that kind of thing. So I actually really quite like using sort of the online whiteboards or the interactive whiteboards where I can type on them. Um, so, but what I, the reason why I'm telling you this is basically I have my own sort of techniques that I use. They might work for you. They might not work for you. I think everybody sort of has their own style with their whiteboards. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the best practice that you can have and tell you a bit about some games and talk a bit about teaching online as well with it. So it's going to be about face to face and teaching online. So first thing is I've actually taught. I've trained uh, teachers and they have said to me, why do I need to use a whiteboard? I've got a textbook. Oh, we've got chairs, we've got tables. I've given them a good handout. Why do we need to use a whiteboard? Um, and the first thing that I always say is you need to emphasize things in your lesson. There are certain parts of your lesson, whether it's vocabulary or grammar or skills, that you need to show the students is important. And actually writing something on a whiteboard is an interesting and important way to do that. We don't want students, you know, on a whiteboard, we don't write down everything we say. We tend to, a bit like a PowerPoint here, we emphasize and we say certain things. And that's why a whiteboard is really, really important as a teacher. Also, it's important to help visual learners. So I like to learn through listening. That's personally me, but some people are more in tune to learn through looking at something. Some people are maybe more in tune to uh, speaking it through, or some people are more in tune to uh, reading. And I think that, um, uh, putting things on a whiteboard is an important way of helping people who are actually visual learners. And there's whole lots of websites about learning styles. It's quite interesting to go into. I'm not going to go into them all, but it's definitely something that's worth looking at if that's something you want to lift your teaching up a bit is different learning styles. 
One of the key points, I think, is on whiteboards is to keep records of the vocabulary that you've learned in the lesson. So I'm going to show you in a minute a layout of a whiteboard that I think works. And uh, you'll see that there's a section on there for um, uh, vocabulary and uh, on the right hand side. And I think it's a good way throughout the lesson to learn and to, for the students to remember vocabulary that they have been taught that's new. Whiteboards can also liven up your lessons. So uh, if you're, you know, it can be a bit dull for students if they're just sat still in their chairs, getting them out on a whiteboard where they're writing on it, where they're sort of working together, whether they're discussing it, whether they're playing a game um, is a fantastic way to liven up your lessons. Uh, oh, I can see all the hellos are coming in. We've got people in from uh, Tahoe. I hope I said that right. Uh, Paul's in Philadelphia. Hi, Harry's in Yala Man, not far from me. Uh, Karanfa is in India. Look at how California's in uh, Philadelphia, Belarus, and Vindhuk, Namibia. Megon, I spent a beautiful weekend in Vindhuk many, many years ago. I really enjoyed it. Uh, okay, right. So let's carry on with this. Now, what do you need to consider? So if you are new to teaching or you want to improve your whiteboard technique, what do you need to look at, first of all, in order to sort of to plan how you're going to improve? And the first thing is size. So I have been very lucky to have worked in places where they have really big, massive whiteboards. And I'm sort of talking by sort of three meters across, two meters down, that sort of size. I have also been in teaching places where they have given me whiteboards to hold or to put on a chair or something like that, that are literally the size of an A4 piece of paper. So how you use these whiteboards really does matter on the size that you are, you've got. And most schools will hopefully give you a good size whiteboard. Now, obviously that I'm talking there just about a pen and a whiteboard, which you have to wipe clean yourself, all that kind of thing. Obviously, there are also interactive whiteboards. These are ones where you can sort of put PowerPoints up, you can put websites up, you know, you can play sound through them, all kind of crazy things. Um, and that's fine. I'll talk a little bit about those. But the majority of whiteboards that I've taught on around the world have been physical, a pen and a whiteboard. You have to write it when you finish. You have to scrub it out, that kind of thing. Size will make you sort of change how you plan your whiteboards, because obviously if you've only got a small little A4 whiteboard, that is very different from a three by two meter one. So think about the size when you're sort of planning them. Uh, think about the pens you use. I have shown I've observed teachers who worked for me when I was managing schools and they would somehow sometimes use pens that were running out. They would sometimes write them all in red. These don't actually come up very clear. They might look clear when you're up close to the board, but believe it or not, you've really got to consider the types of pens that you use. Handwriting, this is something that I um, always have to remember. I remember on my teacher training course, my first uh, observed lesson, the, the trainer looking at it, they said to me, Carl, if you don't improve your handwriting on the board, I am going to fail you on this course. It is impossible for us to read what you're writing. I looked at it. I thought it was fine. Really, really important to, you know, get someone else to check your handwriting, make sure that it is clear. The speed you write at is also important. Obviously, you don't want to write too quickly so you make lots of mistakes and it's not clear. But also, the more time you're spent facing the board, the less time you are looking at your students. So you do have to get a happy amount of speed in with accuracy to make sure that your writing is correct. Another thing that I've observed in some of my lessons is that I've, I've seen people teach in the class and not all of the students are looking at the whiteboard or they're in a position or they're in a position in the classroom where they have to turn 180 degrees in order to view the whiteboard. That's not good. You can't be turning, looking, writing as a student really impossible will hurt their necks eventually all that kind of thing so really make sure that your whiteboard's in a place or the seats are in a place where they can all see the whiteboard you might think this is crazy but it's really really simple so 
How I now do it, and I think this is good practice generally, and you'll find lots of websites about this where people have sort of said how to divide it. I don't think I'm, I'm making up something here that's totally new. But this is how I divide it if I've got enough room for all the sections. This is also how I do it online. And I can see some questions coming in about what online whiteboards do I use. I'm going to show you one in a minute. And this is how I divide up. So I have on one section, one side, I have the vocabulary that we've learned in that lesson. If I'm organized, I also have on a separate shared document all the vocabulary we've learned from the whole term. So after we've done one lesson, I then take that vocabulary and I put it into a shared document. The students have a link to that. And in that is all the, the ones that we've learned from the last term. But on the whiteboard, I would only have the ones that I'm doing in this lesson or the new ones that have come up as I've taught them. I also like to have the aims of the lesson written at the top. So, you know, the grammar aims, the vocabulary aims or the pronunciation aims or the listening aims, whatever it might be, the aims of the lesson. I like to put at the bottom any mistakes I've heard as I've monitored the students either through listening to them or looking at their writing. Um, I also then have the main work area where I might present the grammar. I might do some work on the form or the, la or the meaning or the pronunciation in the main work area that bit gets erased a lot. The bits around the outside tend to stay. Mistakes sometimes get erased as we moved on to the next bit, but the, the main work area gets erased and cleared a lot. If I'm working somewhere where I've got textbooks, I like to put the page number at the top, especially at the start of the lesson, so students know what page to go to, and also latecomers know what, um, uh, what page to go to if they're 10, 15 minutes late. If I have a quite badly behaved class or if I have a class that are a little bit lax at keeping to some of the rules we have, I sometimes write the rules that I want them to keep to at the top. So this could be things like don't eat in class, could be the times of the break, could be um, English only if you're going to enforce that in the class. So let me just um, show you here. Uh, whiteboard. Now, this is from a website called tutorialspoint.com. And I hope you can see that. Yeah, Alan, I don't know if we can make me smaller and the screen bigger. Yeah, that's better. OK, thank you. So you can see here at the top, I've got the aims. And as we go through the lesson, I tick them off when we've done them, basically. Uh, here are some of the rules that I have. Now, I'm not a big stickler for English only. I think there is a place in the classroom for every now and again for them to be speaking in the L1. But if we've got a classroom where, if we've got a class where uh, the rules, they're, they're really always talking in their Spanish or French, whatever it might be, I would write that here. And then at the side here, I think you can see some vocabulary. I would uh, put the word class down the side here. I would do um, some work on the pronunciation if I can, you know, syllable, syllable stressed, what sort of thing, that kind of thing. Um, at the bottom here, mistakes. So I, I heard, so we we're saying practice using the present continuous. I heard I wearing. The correct one is I am wearing. I'd write that at the bottom. Again, that might get erased. Then in the middle here, I would um, uh, put, put the main work area. And here, try and be as colorful as you can. Uh, this tutorials point is pretty good, I think, in downloading, sharing, doing collaborative work. Where I think it is, myself, I think it's a bit difficult is for um, changing the colors of the words that you type. So how, if I was writing, and obviously it's quite difficult to write with uh, a mouse as I am now. Um, so I would, Try, if I can, put them in colors to show that this is the subject, this is the B verb, this is the verb ing, this is plus the object, that kind of thing. But if you're going to type it, which I think probably looks a bit most clear and is good on interactive whiteboards, uh, you would hope you could put a green underline just to show the sections that you're in. So that's how I would divide up um, a whiteboard. And you might find that this bit you don't really need. 
you might find you want to expand this bit. You might find that you don't have enough space for this bit at the top here. You don't have enough space for this bit at the bottom. Depends on the side. I think this works for an online whiteboard, and it also works on a big um, one you might have in your classroom. It doesn't, you know, dividing it up into lots of sections, you've got quite a small whiteboard can be difficult. So what you might do there is have some, uh, you might put that on a, a Word document, and then you can show it on the screen if you've got an interactive whiteboard or a projector even. Some, some schools have a projector, which isn't interactive, and they have a whiteboard, that kind of thing. So you've really got to adapt this to work for your own uh, um, situation. Just while I'm here, if you type in online whiteboard into Google, you'll see that there's lots and lots of different ones. OK, I myself like this one tutorials point. But as I'm going to talk about in a minute, I think you're also perfectly fine to use the ones that um, are that sort of come in built into Microsoft Teams or something like that. It really does sort of depend on you. OK. Please, any questions as we're going along, or if you disagree with me, or if you've got any points you want to make, please also put that in the chat. The chat, I can, I've, we've already highlighted some questions that we're going to get to at the end of this presentation. Right. I love to get the students involved in my classes, whether it's a face to face class or whether it's an online class. They 100% can come and write or draw on the board, whether that is an online board or whether that is a face to face board. I love it. I think it's fantastic. Students love it. Now, the online one can take a little bit of time to, to get used to. They might find that, you know, obviously holding it, doing it with a mouse can be quite difficult sometimes. So I think, you know, a few times give them a bit of practice on it. Make sure that they, you don't, you know, have a go. You don't joke too much if the diagrams are bad, that kind of thing. Definitely they can. Um, check that they understand how to use an interactive whiteboard, check that they can understand how to use an online one. So for example, on an interactive whiteboard, if you're holding the pen on the, on the, 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 uh, the board, if you also put your hand on it, sometimes it doesn't work very well. You know, check that they know that only maybe one at a time can do it. Some interactive whiteboards allow two at a time, but you know, check that they can understand how to use it, check that they can understand how to use it if you're doing an online shared one in a collaborative Teams or, or Skype or whatever it might be. Get them to take photos of the whiteboard, online or face-to-face. -face. So with an online one, you can sort of flick between them. So it's a bit like a PowerPoint. You can push a button and it'll go to the next one. And that's the same with an interactive whiteboard. But with a face-to-face -face one, if you're trying to erase it, I think you're perfectly fine to say, students, right, okay, this is an important one. Take this photo. They might take the photo and never look at it, but also gets involved and shows that the whiteboard is important. Ask before you erase anything. Um, you'd be surprised how many times I've erased something and the students go, oh, I was looking at that or I, I need that up. Or can you go back and can you write that again? You know, if you get them to take photos and then you ask before you erase it, that won't uh, feel like a, a, a chore to them. It won't feel difficult to them. Definitely ask before you erase it. And get and play games. I'm going to describe a few games you can play in a minute. Um, but definitely play games using the whiteboard. Don't make the whiteboard a teacher only thing. Get them involved and get them using it. So let's first of all talk about language skills and practice. So what have I done on online whiteboards, interactive whiteboards, face to face whiteboards? I have done gap fields on that. So something like if you're doing some work on grammar, you put in um a sentence with a missing verb in, for example, uh, you can write them, you can either type them on, you can prepare it in advance, or you can write it as you go. And I get students up to fill in the gaps. Now, if you're doing it face to face, it can take a while to write out the sentence. If you're doing it online with an interactive whiteboard, you can copy and paste them in if you prepare them in advance. But get the students up writing in the gap fills. Rearranging the sentence. So you can do this with face to face. You can do it with online. You can do it with uh, interactive. Basically, what that is, you if you're doing it online or interactive, you put the words in separate text boxes. The students have to drag the words in to make a sentence to, to work on their syntax. If you are doing it uh, face to face, they could number the words or they could just rewrite them themselves. 
match the word to the definition. So you've got all the, um, vo- you've got the new words, uh, it's almost like your pre-teaching vocabulary. You've got the words on one side, you've got some definitions. They have to work together. You give them, right, you four, you're doing word number one and number two. You four, you're doing word number three and four. Come up and then draw a line between the word and the definition. Get them involved. Highlight the words. You might uh, project or you might um, copy and paste in a text. You have to get them to work together to highlight the nouns, highlight the verbs, all that kind of thing. Uh, Comprehension questions. You might put the text in front of them, but you have the questions up on the board. And that might actually sometimes give a bit more discussion in it. They then can come up and write the answers on the board. They can type the answers into an interactive whiteboard, something like that. These are just some of the simple ways you can use a whiteboard within your lesson plan. You can also set the tasks. So I think it's really important to to write on the task, right? This is a speaking exercise. Discuss with your partner the following. Something like that. Set the tasks and put it up on the whiteboard. Uh, Okay, whiteboard games. So some of the ones that I've played before. So the classic whiteboard game is Pictionary. What is Pictionary? It's basically you put the students in teams. One student comes up. They have to draw a piece of vocabulary you give them. They then have to, um, uh, the the rest of their team has to guess what they're they're writing. Basically, as simple as that. So this works really well with a face-to-face whiteboard, but I have also used it online and I've used it on interactive whiteboards. They come up and they draw it. And again, it takes a bit of practice. It might look a bit silly, but but after they've done it a few times, they improve, they understand, they know where the eraser is on it. They're doing it. Pictionary is a great way of enforcing vocabulary and also a good bit of fun. Uh, Noughts and crosses. So you divide a grid, you divide your white, part of your whiteboard up into uh, nine cells. And then they have to, uh, you ask them maybe some voc- a vocabulary question, you ask them a comprehension question. In their teams, they discuss, they give you the answer. The first one to give you the correct answer gets to put the X or the O first, three in a row, they win. Um, Hit the word. So I've done this with kids, especially. Uh, You've got lots of words up on the board. This works really well if you're keeping a a record of all the vocabulary you've been doing for the last six months, something like that. And you've got all these words up. You've got one person versus another person. They have to run and hit the word for the definition you're giving. So if it's uh, let's say you're doing uh, cloves and you say something like you wear this on your head hat. They run, they whack the whiteboard and you give the point to whoever's doing that. If you're doing it online, they can um, highlight the word. So you, they all have access to the online uh, whiteboard and some whiteboards tell you who did the scribble. You can, um, uh, Use use that and you can see who actually scribbled, who actually circled the correct word to do that first. Um, interactive whiteboards, this does work, but you've got to be careful they don't hit the interactive whiteboard too hard because they um, might break the interactive whiteboard and you might end up with a big bill. Uh, describe the word. So uh, you, um, you put some, right, basically you get them, you get one student to put their back to the board the others have to describe it without saying the word it's sometimes it's called a bit like the the board game's called taboo it's a bit like that so you can do something like that um describe the word uh remember if you google taboo uh classroom game taboo you'll you'll get that uh remember the sentence uh so this is you write a sentence on the board Sorry, I should say with describe the word. I did brush them. If you want to do that online, you can, um, instead of using an interactive whiteboard, you can, because everybody can see an interactive whiteboard, it's quite hard online to get them to to change, to not face the interactive whiteboard, to the online whiteboard. What you can do with that is you can um, po- uh, post the word in a private chat to one student or to a group of students then they have to describe it to the other students. Okay, so there is a way around it. Remember the sentence. You put the sentence on a board. You then have to, then you you say, right, okay, remember this sentence. And then you scribble out two words, 
they then have to work together to try and remember what the words is. You then scribble out. They don't write at this point. You then scribble out four words, six words until there's nothing left. They then have to write down the sentence together or they come up on the board and write it themselves. Again, can be done online pretty easily. Um, my absolutely favorite game to play online with a whiteboard is something called Stop the Bus. It's a vocabulary game. You um, put some categories on, you write a letter, for example, the letter S. The students have to work together to write down a fruit beginning with S, a color beginning with S, a sport beginning with S. Stop the bus. So please, any questions, please do put them in the chat. Uh, how to use the whiteboard online. OK, I honestly believe all activities can be replicated online. I have never found an activity which I can't do online. Now, I there, some do work better face to face. Some work better online. I, I totally 100 percent agree with that. But I have never, ever come across an activity that I've not been able that I've not been able to take from the physical classroom and use online. I honestly believe there's a way to do it with a bit of thinking. Uh, so what if you are going to use a whiteboard online? Check which software suits you. So you've got some that are used within the video software. So, for example, Microsoft Teams has a whiteboard option. Zoom has a whiteboard option. OK. Um, or you can get external ones like I have had there, which I just showed you before. And I think there are positives and negatives to both. Some of the some of the external software ones, I think, have a bit more functionality. However, they can be a bit more difficult to set up with the students. It's another thing that they've got to get their head around. Whereas if you've got it on Zoom or you've got it on Skype, for example, it appears on their screen a bit more easily. You can also it also allows you a bit more easily to see who's written on it. That kind of thing. So there are positives and negatives to both of them. Uh, the external ones, I think, can can be you can. You can keep them up a little bit more easily after the calls. You can plan it a bit more beforehand. OK, so just something to think about. Uh, don't be afraid to get the students writing or typing on an online whiteboard. It is definitely fine. It definitely works. OK, uh, they will get used to it after a bit. Show them how to type it. You know, you know, give them an example. You go to the left hand side, you click on this, you click there and you type. Um, if you think that there's this activity that you've read about that's fantastic, you can maybe use, not use the whiteboards, but you can get the activity going within the chat function. So that allows you to sort of control who can read it. And that's sometimes useful in the classroom in, in order to, to, to get some activities going. Okay. Final tips. Practice writing on whiteboards online interactive face to face whatever it might be don't you know make sure you, if you're going online you know what to click to do that to get your text up you know what to click to change the color you know what to click to erase if you're going to do an interactive whiteboard again you know make sure you know what happens when you click on a pen you you're practicing not writing with your hand resting on it all that kind of thing yeah practice right you know spend 10 15 minutes doing it it will really really improve uh, practice using the software. If it's an interactive whiteboard, it will have some good little bits of software. You know, you might be able to get timers up on your screen. You might be able to uh, put boxes over things to cover it, all that kind of thing that can also be done online. Um, online whiteboards, they all are a little bit different. You know, if you're doing Zoom, you're doing Skype, set up a little call, practice on it. Show, Make sure you know what to do, because if you don't know how to use the software, how will the students know how to use the software? Uh, stand back and look at your boards. Don't think, oh, it looks that board looks amazing, because when you go to the back of the room, believe it or not, they might it might look different with the light shining on it. It might look different with the pens that you've used. You might have written it too small. You might have written it too big. OK, stand back and have a look at your boards. Correct all the errors on your board. Whatever you put on the board, students sort of take it as their gospel. Don't think that because it's on a board, it doesn't really matter so much. 
If you are, have pretty bad spelling, check your spellings, because if you've written something up there with a bad spelling mistake and the student writes it down, they will repeat that spelling mistake for the rest of their life if you don't correct it. OK, so correct all the errors, no matter how small those errors are, even if it's like your T's don't look right. Correct it. Definitely get students to take photos. I, I, I know people that say, oh, I don't want my students taking photos in the class. Fine. I, you know, if you've got a good argument, but I've not heard of an argument that convinces me yet. Don't overcomplicate things on the interactive online or the face to face whiteboards. I think it's very easy to try and do a lot on your whiteboard. Keep it simple. Keep it clear. But also do every now and again, try and mix it up, you know, play some games, that kind of thing on it. Why not? It's there. It's a teaching tool for you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, now, I'm going to get to some questions. Thank you for staying with me for the last sort of 20 minutes. Quang, hi, hello. Uh, could you please recommend some good online whiteboard that we could use for teaching? So, as I said, I think it really does sort of depend on you, Quang. You know, I, I don't think you can really go wrong on using the embedded ones within the video call software. Some, they don't have as much functionality as some others, but, you know, they're being added to all the time. And I do think it's a little bit more easy to use within the, the Zoom call, that kind of thing. You know, if you if you want to use one of the external ones, then I think the one that I just showed you um, uh, called tutorialspoint.com, you can find it on there, I think is a good one. But I, you know, I think just have a play around with a few, Quang, just see whatever you want to do. It depends what you want to do. All have a, the similar basic functionality, typing on it, copying and pasting pictures onto it, inserting pictures, you know, downloading them, uh, saving them, changing the colors, drawing shapes. They all have that sort of similar functionality. It's more sort of how you feel about it. Yeah. But play around with it. Quite, okay. Elizabeth. Hi, how are you? Um, if you're messing with the online whiteboard, I have been guilty of that in the past. Would it make more sense to make class notes on a blank page in Microsoft Word? Um, yeah, so that's a good one. So you, I have done lessons, especially if it's one-on-ones where I don't use in, don't use whiteboards. I find that I can do a lot of what I want to do inside a Google shared document. And you've sent that link out to the students. And as long as the students have got that link, they can, and you don't ever erase that document. It's there as a record for them for ages. And I think that there's definitely an argument to be had where that you don't really, especially with adults, need to use an, a, an interactive online whiteboard one on one online. I think you can perfectly get by with Google Documents or a shared Microsoft Word document. Yeah. Um, so play around with that. Elizabeth. I don't know if you're talking about if you're talking about big groups, then, you know, I think, you know, that I think there's a place for this. But there's also a place for the whiteboard to emphasize some things. OK. I find it a little bit easier to edit a Word document or a Google document to highlight it, change the colors, add bold, make the sizes bigger, all that kind of thing. Uh, definitely a good point, Elizabeth. Uh, hi, everyone that's saying hello. Lynn's in South Wales. Hi. Uh, Paul's in California. Vanda's in Tampa. We've got lots of people in from America. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Helen, hi. Um, oh. Oh. What online resources can I recommend for teaching Cambridge Vantage for TEFL? I, 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 do you know, I, I don't even want to make up anything. I have been teaching for 20 years, coming up to 20 years. Uh, that's making me feel old. And um, I have never actually taught to Cambridge exams. I've never taught them. I've never examined them. I've never had a student that's ever asked me to do them. So I really don't know. If anybody can help Helen out, please do that. But uh, Helen, I'm really sorry. I don't want to, I can't say anything. That I think we'll help you. I'm sorry. Um, I feel terrible now, for Helen. Erica, hi. Is age a blocking point, is a block to finding a job in teaching in Spain? So Erica, first thing is the if you feel that you are, in advancing mature years, if you feel like you are, then Europe is the best place to go. The reason being is because they have more laws in Europe to allow people to keep teaching until a certain age. 
especially, well, really only if you've got a European Union passport. Can be quite difficult, not impossible, can be quite difficult to go and teach uh, in the European Union, such as Spain, if you don't have an EU passport. But definitely um, it's a lot easier to go teach in Spain. And I have worked with people who are in their 80s in Spain. Um, it's a lot easier than going to China or something where, where they have an upper limit on the visa. OK, so definitely, Erica, Spain is the best place if you are uh, committed to living in a certain part of Spain. Go knock on a few language schools and say, hi, I'm Erica. How you doing? Uh, I bet you'll find some work. Um, Arshad's in Iraq. Hi, Arshad. I had a great time in my life in Iraq. Tobias in Oslo. Hi. Q and Sons. Who is Q? And he has sons or she has sons. How many students can you teach with a standard whiteboard? My current limit is eight to ten. Uh, Cork. You're in Cork. How are you doing, Q and Sons? Uh, right. Um, right. So I have taught groups of 200 students before with a whiteboard. Now, that was a projected whiteboard. So it was easier to to get the text on to zoom in so everyone at the back could see. If you have a standard whiteboard, now, if you're talking about a standard, I'm um, guessing you're talking face to face, uh, Q. Uh, if you're if it's a standard whiteboard, so around about, let's say, a meter and a half by a meter and a half, you know, not massive, but a good size. I have done classes of 30 or 40 with that. No problem at all. I don't think there is a limit. Now, online, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult because everybody sort of, you've got you've got to have good control. You've got to really designate who can write and who can type and putting people into teams is a good way of doing that breakout rooms, that kind of thing. Um, so online, no, I think, you know, you're probably looking at about 20 maximum, I would say online. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I don't think a standard whiteboard is as long as they can see it. What well, you can have as many as you want in there, I think uh hello everyone hello everyone hello everyone. hello uh mary hi um you have a degree in honors and you're considering a change of careers you want to travel good on you you're 48 no it's not too late for tefl uh right okay i don't know about the funding side of things look we offer tefl courses so if you go on our website tefl.org you will, and then if you click at the top courses, you will see the courses that we offer. And the magic number, if you're going to do any TEFL course to go abroad, is to get a course that's 120 hours. That means you study for 120 hours. And the reason why that is the magic number is because that is what companies around the world look for as a minimum in their teachers. They look for an accredited course where the Trainee teachers are learning for 120 hours. Now, we are not the only provider of that by any means. There are other providers out there. I think we're a good provider. Our courses are checked and accredited, but there are other ones out there. Mary, our courses are not free. I'm going to throw it out there. And the reason I would be aware of a free course is, would you personally like to have a teacher in front of you that did a basic course that was free teaching you. Now you'd probably want a teacher in front of you if you were paying your hard money in China, Japan, wherever it might be, you would probably want, you would want someone that's had a good course and knows what they're doing, okay? Good luck finding the free one. I hope it works out. Um, right, uh, what was your last question? 48 is not, your first question, 48 is not too late for TEFL, for sure, no. I mean, I am hoping to go tefling abroad again once my daughter has grown up in sort of 10 15 years and i'll be in my mid 50s then you know good luck mary hope it works out for you erica i've gone through a few online whiteboards i hope that has helped you um everyone's telling us about our plans hello hello that's great yes it will be available to watch again later um we have lots of these videos i've done on a range of subjects monica hi what is my take on non-native teachers getting esl jobs in singapore right interesting singapore is an interesting esl destination 
Uh, there are language schools in Singapore. 100% there are. Um, a lot of the classes are for teaching kids in Singapore. Um, you will find that a lot of the adults already teach, as already speak English to a good standard in Singapore, or they speak Singlish, which is like a jokey version of English, what people call with a bit of a Singapore twist. Um, there are language schools there. Now, I personally don't know what the degree requirements are, Monica, and I don't know personally for Singapore what the visa requirements are. So is it like China where they only allow certain work visas for certain countries? If it is, then if you've got a, a passport that links to that work visa, happy days. If you don't, it's it's a pretty much of a no-go right from the start. Countries around the world have limits on what countries they allow to get work visas. I've done um, webinars on this, if it's something you want to look at, Monica. Uh, right. The other thing that I've, I lived in Vietnam and I went to Singapore quite a bit. Um, it's a beautiful place that is very well organized and very, very clean and very, very tidy. And I'm sure it's a great place to live and work in. However, housing and things like that are quite expensive. It's not the cheapest of places to live. So I would be very, very clear in the wage and the, I would check very, very clearly what sort of accommodation you're going to get, that kind of thing, before I go to somewhere like Singapore. OK, uh, good luck, Monica. Um, lots of questions, lots of people also telling about the points. Yeah, don't worry, everyone, you can watch it again 49,000 times. Like us every time. No, don't like us every time because then you'll undo it. Just like us once. Share it 49 times. Uh, Plague Von Karma, what a name. You said you taught in China before. You're looking to work there when your course is done. What are some of the things you wish you were told before you taught there? <laughs> ah, interesting. Uh, Right. I the first thing that I've always thought about with China is uh, I wish I had been told that there is a lot more to China than just the big main cities that you've heard of on the news. Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, for example. Like my favorite place that I lived in China was a town a city called Kunming um, in the south. It's tropical. It was lovely. I didn't really get enough time there as I would like to have done. So what I would say is there are lots and lots of jobs in China. Some of them will be in cities that you've never heard of, or some will be in cities that you have heard of. Do some research about what sort of tourist things there are to do in the cities that you've not heard of, because I bet you'd be surprised actually how nice they are. Um, what other things that I wish I'd been told is that uh, the students are a lot quieter than you think they are going to be, even though you think they're going to be quieter. So you've got to be fully on the go and you've got to have loads of energy. But that's sort of similar for a lot of teaching jobs. Good luck, Plague. China's a great place to go. I honestly think it's fantastic. Um, Gerard, I think I've said your name wrong, but I really apologise. What's that limit on the visa for teaching in Vietnam? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if Alan can help me that. I don't know off the top of my head if it's 60, 60 years old, I think. Uh, I don't know, Gerard. You, that, that, a quick Google will tell you that. Just type in work visa age limit Vietnam. OK. Um, no problem, Mark. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Erica. Can you build on top of 120 hours course? Yes. So the 120 hours course is the basic level that everyone sort of really should go as a minimum. However, as teachers, we are always learning. And, you know, me, myself, I've got 120 hour course. I've got a CELTA. I've got a Delta Masters. I've done other courses in, in terms of managing schools and that kind of thing. If you think you're going to do this to any sort of level of professionalism or if you can do it for any sort of length of time, I really recommend that you maybe add on some things that are interested to you. So, Erica, for example, we've got modules in teaching exams. I love teaching exams. We've got modules in terms of teaching business. I love teaching business. We've got modules in terms of teaching kids. I hate teaching kids, but most of the jobs are teaching kids. You might like teaching kids. So you've done your 120 hour. That will talk about how to teach skills, how to talk, teach grammar, how to teach vocabulary. Um but you might think, do you know what? I also want to know more about teaching kids. You can do an add on to that. There you go. We also do a level five course, which goes into it in more detail. OK. Uh, um, Juana, hi. 
how challenging is it to get a job in Spain? I don't think I think Spain's one of the better places as a non-native speaker to go to. I think that um, if you can prove your English and if your lessons are good, you know, they're interactive, your lessons are fun, that kind of thing. I think Spain is one of the better places to 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 go and work in for sure. Um, I love working in Spain. I think Spain's a fantastic place. Um Good luck. I've done I've done webinars about non-native speakers. Go for it. Uh, go watch them. Uh, Chuck Woody. Hi. What is the minimum one can earn? If, how long is your piece of string? I know people that have lived in Mexico earning two hundred dollars a month. Absolutely having the time of their life. Absolutely loved it. I know people that have lived in Saudi Arabia earning eighty thousand dollars a year tax free. Didn't really love it, but went for the money. There is no set wage around the world as a TEFL teacher. What I always say to you is people who say, oh, oh, you know, I want I want to earn a bit of money. I always say chase the oil. Oil countries pay more than other countries. And but never, ever think you're going to be a millionaire. You're always going to be slightly better than the average. OK, uh, good luck. Um, I think that's the last question, is it? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. If you want to learn more, um, please go on our website, tefl.org. We've got sections in the blog post there about um, lots of different things. OK, uh, there's lots and lots of YouTube videos. There's lots and lots of websites about using um, web, uh, using whiteboards, lots of different techniques. OK, Um we have done lots of these videos over the last few years on a range of different subjects. So go on YouTube, look at all the ones that we have, uh, look on our Facebook page, look at the, there's lots of YouTube videos on that, that kind of thing. There's lots of videos on that where you'll see my face talking about a load of different subjects. If you want more information about, please do um, get send us a message. You can send us a message through Facebook. You can go on our website, tefl.org. There's a chat with us function in the bottom right. Send us a message on that. OK, thank you, everyone. Um, please do like us and all that kind of thing, because, you know, I'm a vain person and uh, we'll be back soon with another video.